was at leisure, and now we're getting this just glamour god.
and now we're getting this just glamour god.
had seizure, and now we're getting this just glamour god.
at leisure, and now we're getting this just glamour dog. Music expression. 
you know. It wipes away all of the things that are going on in here while you're performing, whether you're a vocalist, whether you're instrumentalist. You know, a lot of us, we're, we're in our heads, you know. Okay, I got this passage, this is a, this is a difficult passage I'm getting to come up to, you know. I, I gotta, I've got to get through this passage, you know. But when you're in tune, when you're in sync, you don't even worry about that, you know. Because the music that you're producing is at such a high level that all of that stuff just falls away. It's no longer there. It's no longer, and I'm not saying that it hinders you, but it keeps you from getting to that oneness, that unity with, with, with the music. You know, it's the difference between playing and expression, you know. And feel free if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. So, I was really thinking about students when I decided to take on this subject matter uh, because I think students, you're taught like this, right? You know, you got it, you got it, yeah. But what, what, what do great artists do? They take that and they take it to another level. They take it to another level. And each and one, each and every one of us in here can experience that. And some may have already experienced it, you know. You want to have a seat? Please. You're not interrupting us. This is a kind of an informal, formal talk. So I have a question I want to ask you all. What did you think about the subject of the title, the other side of performance? What, what led you to come and check this out? Anyone want to tell me why? I'm not going to be the first one to answer. <laughs> OK, whoever. OK, go ahead. Yes, sir. So hi, I'm Morale again, the director of community doing a series with the festival entitled Dissolving Paradigms. And in those series, we've been talking a lot about this kind of structure that is given to us as musicians, as artists, and how it hinders us at, at many, in many areas um, from being authentic, from communicating. And not only in the performance aspect, but when we start to think about who gets to tell a story in this field? Who gets to perform classical music? Who gets to even perform new music? Um, there are so many structures, as you said, that prohibit us from actually being human beings. Mm -hmm. And as you, you know, said, expressing ourselves and getting. So when I saw the, the title, I was like, ah, that's <laughs> it. We need to get to the other side of, of performing because performing comes with all of this baggage of structure. And, and there's nothing wrong with performance. No. There's nothing wrong with it. But personally, as a musician, I strive to get better. Every time I open my mouth to sing, every time I pick up an instrument to play it. Uh, and so having experienced that relationship with music where I am music on one and I am allowing the music to flow through me. In other words, I'm not controlling what's happening. Although I am, but I'm not. You understand what I'm saying? And so that's when I say the magic happened. Music in ancient time was not for entertainment so much, it was for healing. And it was used to heal the community. And I just strongly feel that's what music should be about. I mean, but we live in a different kind of world now, and so the priorities are different. And as you were saying earlier, there are structures built in place 
to drive a certain kind of paradigm in the music industry, you know. So I want to get to these exercises. They're called breathing exercises. And what they do is they help you to relax. As you well know, the more relaxed you are, the better you perform. When you have tension in your body or tension in your intellect, it restricts your performance output, right? So, and these exercises are done, your inhalation is done through your nostril as well as your exhalation. So I always begin my breathing exercises with what I call the cleansing breath. So this is a breath where you breathe in for a certain count and then you let all the air out forcefully. But because of COVID, we're not going to do that, <laughs> right? Uh, we'll do the other exercises, but that's how you begin because what that does, it gets all the stale air out of your lungs and uh, it prepares you to start the breathing exercise. So we're gonna do a simple one, which is a, a uh, five count inhalation, hold for five, exhale for 10. And you continue to do this. It's like um, filling up a glass. So when you're taking your breath, you want your breath to go to the bottom of your lung. You don't want to breathe up here. Any, any woodwind players in here? Brass players? Singers? Okay. So you know there's a certain way that you have to breathe. So you breathe up here, what are you doing? What are you doing to your breath? And your chest breathing? Does it come shorter to talk? Hmm? Does it come shorter to talk? Yeah. You're restricting your breath. You're limiting the amount of air that you're taking into your body. Okay? So everyone sit up straight. All right? We're going to breathe in for the count of five. Hold it for five. Then we're going to exhale through the nose for five. Uh, ten counts, right? Excuse me. All right. This is the pulse. One, two, three, four. Five. Ready? Begin. One, two, three, four, five. Hold. Two, three, four, five. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In. Two, three. Four, five, hold, two, three, four, five, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, in, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, Five, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Relax. How did that feel? Was it hard? Did anybody have difficulty? Well, now it's so hard. <laughs> okay. So, if you have a dip, where was the difficulty part? Um, I think for me it was actually slowing my breathing down. Okay. Particularly on the exhale. I really don't go for it, but I think particularly on the exhale. Okay. So I have another exercise that causes you to calm down even more. And this is a real simple one. You're breathing in, you're breathing out. Just like you're filling the glass and you're emptying the glass. You're filling the glass. The glass. So we're going to do this on the number seven. So we're going to breathe in for seven and exhale for seven. Okay. 
Everyone ready? Breathe in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, relax. Now this particular exercise, you want to do it, I would say a minimum of 10 minutes. What it does is it slows the heart rate, it causes you to relax more, you begin to take in more oxygen so your breath, your breath is deeper, and it kind of puts you in a, a meditative state, okay? And so while you're doing this exercise, you can do it in the car, you can do it backstage before you go on and to perform, and it really, it really helps to uh, prepare you to get ready to perform. Okay? Does anyone have any kind of things that they do before they get ready to perform they want to share? No? Yes, go ahead. No, I just love lie on the ground with my knees up. Mm -hmm. It's a mix of going to the ground. It's like a relaxation exercise. Okay. So you lay on your back? I lay on my back. So, you know, when you lay on your back, it causes you to breathe completely. Mm -hmm. You know, like a newborn baby. You ever watch a newborn baby, what's happening with their body when they're breathing? They're expanding in the midsection where their stomach is, and they contract. Because they're deep, breathe deeply, deeply. And when you lay it on your back with your knees, that forces you to do that. Anyone else in, do anything? No? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've been trying to, I feel like when I go on stage, I start focusing really intently on one spot. So to counteract that, I've been trying to focus on the periphery of my vision. And that calms the nervous system down. It's like fighting the, the fight or flight. It's like putting the nervous right. system back. Right. That's good. So there, there are certain techniques that people have discovered or were taught to use to help them to kind of go into a zone before they get ready to go perform, you know. And, and when you're able to do that, when you're relaxed like that, it makes your performance that much better, you know. And it, it, it just opens your ears up. Um, you hear yourself better. Uh, you're able to just do a lot of different things um, with the music when you're in that particular state of being. Um, I didn't want to um, present this, and I think I'm not presenting it in a way that's is knocking music performance. Music performance, it's like a it's like a gradual graduation of things, you know. It's like when you, a lot of musicians, when they first start out, they'll sound like their favorite musician. Okay. Eventually, they find their own voice. Uh, and some people come out with their own voice from the very beginning, you know. Uh, 
When I was learning how to sing, I used to uh, admire and try to sound like Nat King Cole and Arthur Price Sock and Billy Eckstein, all of the great male vocalists of that era until I, I found my own voice. And uh, the flute is, was a little different for me. I never really tried to sound like anybody else. Um, I just, uh, my main thing with my, the flute was getting the kind of tone quality that I was looking for, getting that, that sound. And uh, once I got that, then I was, I was good. I was good. So, um, how do you think that this preparation for performances is, is, is something that you would want to get into? Is it something that you think is necessary, that is important uh, as, a, as a musician? Um, any of you all ever uh, tried breathing exercises before you perform to relax? Okay, good, good, good. That's great. I find myself that it, it really helps me to focus and, you know, the thing about that special passage or that special part of the music that you had technical difficulties with and so forth and so on. I always say to myself, you know what? You practice this stuff repetitively, you got it, don't worry about it, it'll happen. You see, I don't worry about it. And, and, and it, it always happens, I get through it, you know. That's the beauty of relaxation, the beauty of confidence. You know, you have to have confidence as a musician, you know. There may be times when you're not feeling confident, but you can find ways to not let it overwhelm you. You know, there are gonna be times when you, you, you know, it's like, okay, wow, I gotta, I gotta hit this high C, you know. That's a high note, that's a hard note, but when you relax and you hit that note and the audience hears it, it's like, whoa, you know, they really appreciate it. That's what the other side of performance is about. It's about getting to that place where the music and you are in sync. You're not intimidated by the music, you're not intimidated by anything that's going on in the performance, and you're ready to just express yourself through that piece of music in the way that is unique within you. It's important for musicians to be their own unique self, you know. It's nothing wrong with mimicking someone in the beginning when you're trying to learn, but as I said earlier, you have to find your own voice. That's sometimes that's part of the process. And some musicians, like I said, they, they just automatically, they come out and they, they, they have their own sound, their own voice, you know. Yes. You had your hand up? I don't mean No, you're not. I said questions. Yeah. Please, please I, ask. You know, I, what's, what's really like very, very interesting to me about the way it, there's well, I, a number of things that I specific and general things that I want to ask about. Uh, one thing that I'm noticing that you're not doing, which is really interesting, is you're not making any distinctions between notated music, completely improvised music, and music that's in between, right? Which say so that's like. Um, so, so I'm really curious about as a person that does mostly notated music and whose preparation process often focuses on the rehearsal. And, and you're also focusing like so much on pre-performance 
from her like immediate, you know, getting herself in a relaxed state, which is candidly a thing that I never do, which is I'm not proud of. <laughs> so this is very useful and interesting to me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about. I really, I really am appreciating the way you're thinking about getting yourself in a place where um, you're, you're free. You're free to not necessarily express yourself, but let the music flow through you. Um, I, I'm, I'd be interested in two things, and you can address either or both. Um, when working with like fully notated music that you did not write, someone else's music, mm -hmm. how do you think about letting that music flow through you when it's not necessarily your music? Can I answer that? Oh yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Um, I play I play classical music as well, mm -hmm. and what I do this is Bach, you know, Bach stuff, Bach. But I love Bach. I love his music. So when I'm playing it, I'm playing it from my Self, not I mean I'm playing the notes because the notes are all there's all the same notes you know uh, so whether the music is notated whether it's improvised whether it's creative that doesn't matter you give the note the value that the note has but in that you know it's just like. That note, you're expressing that note. Even though it was written by someone else, that note becomes your note. That music becomes your music. And you're expressing that particular composer's music through your expression, your experience and life experience, who you are as an individual. You, you, under, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it doesn't matter whether it's notated, whether it's, you know, if it's new music, whatever. It's, it's music. That's all it is. It's music. It's the same eight notes. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is how you express those notes. It's a whole note, it's an eighth note, it's a sixteenth note, it's a thirty-second note, but it's how you express to that note. And it's what art, where artistry comes in is, is the person who's playing. It's just like you listen to uh, Ron Paul playing the flute, and he's playing uh, a Bach piece. And you're like, wow, you know, that inspires you. But you don't play and try to sound like Ron Paul. You play it, sound like yourself. Because you're just as important as that person, as well as the person that wrote the music. So there becomes a, 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 a unifying Thing happening with that with that music and yourself. So it doesn't matter what kind of music or who the, who the composer is or anything. That note, each note has a certain expression that you give it that's unique in you and is in, unique in another person. It's just like you hear certain musicians play a certain one note. You know exactly who it is. Because that person put their personality in that note, even though they're not the composer. And that's what you what you want to do. That's that's what that's part of your goal in expressing yourself musically. Yes sir. I was gonna say just kind and of I'll get back to your section. Sure, yes, just kind of on the slide I didn't make it and um, I find that certainly being relaxed is important. And one of the ways to do that for me is make sure all the tags are done well ahead of time. Everything's that. No hiccups. That way you have no stress. Doing breathing exercises is nice and on the cake. But 
for me, I find that somehow you, need, you really have to be able to hear. Yeah, your ear has to be it. If you can't hear, you bring your ear to your fingers and like shut the brain off in between. It's got to be a fluid action. Mm -hmm. Once you get to that point, when, when your ear is driving your muscles, it's candy on it. Yeah, yeah. That's the zone. That's, that's the zone. Yeah, because improvise, I play a lot of improvised music myself. And, and like you say, you, you, your ears got to be open. And the only way your ears are going to really be fully open is when you relax. Yeah. When you relax, you hear everything. And ideas just begin to flow when you, especially if you're playing improvised music, you know. Um, so yeah, that, that, you're absolutely right. So if you're playing, if you are playing somebody else's music, mm -hmm. then I would think, just based on my own experience, is that you somehow need to be able to hear what was intended, mm -hmm. or hear it in your own frame of reference. And once you hear it, then I think you can do it. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You had a second question. Yeah, I did. You know, I was curious about, um, so, so, so the breathing exercises are very useful. <laughs> I'm going to start doing them because I've been, tell, I've been told how terrible my breathing is, so thank you for that. Um, and, uh, but my question was about, so, so uh, I, you know, even as I'm doing those breathing exercises, I found them very challenging because I have a hard time slowing down my breathing. So I think that would be very useful for me personally going forward. Um, uh, I'm also curious about wh whether you have experienced or have any thoughts on how you know more than one person might get into such a zone for a performance, right? Because sometimes you perform with large ensembles, sometimes you perform with you know quartets. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you yeah, if you have any groups that you've worked with or techniques that you use to try to get everyone who's performing in the same kind of headspace and zone before performance? Yeah, well, my experience has been with the uh, AACM. We have a, a ritual that we do before we perform, and that is we face the East. And in facing the East, uh, we are honoring our ancestors, we're honoring our uh, homeland, and we're focusing and relaxing, and, and we're, we're thinking about the unity of the group and performing whatever music we're getting ready to perform. And so that's one of the things that we've done. I, and <clears throat> excuse me, I've also uh, have done breathing exercises if I'm working with another group of musicians uh, before a performance, we will, we will take time to get still and to focus on uh, what we're getting ready to do and what what our goal is in this performance. I think each each performance should have a goal. What, do you, what is your intent? You're not up there just to play music. You're there to uh, impact your audience, you know, you want the audience to enjoy what you're doing, but you also want the audience to feel the music in the depths of their being. Yes. Um, just to that, one thing that's coming to mind for me in this conversation is um, a little bit of experience, my own experience. So I grew up in church. Um, and was always kind of affected by the music that was happening in church. And I think that, you know, when I started studying classical music and classical singing, so quickly what I remembered or I had experienced in church that felt so natural to me kind of went away for a little bit. And it took kind of coming back to that idea of what you just said, kind of understanding the intention behind what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, when you're singing in church or somebody's singing in church, there is no performance. It's not a performance, really. It's a dialogue, if you will. Right. And so kind of taking that and, and 
this is why I love the topic of, of you know, get beyond the performance, because that's what I remember about those performances, if you want to call them that, at church. It was like, oh no, it's, there's this like dialogue happening between the same on stage and everybody in the audience is feeling, you know, and so I think to, to the point that you were just making, being clear about what the intention is behind your performing is helpful in, in doing the breathing exercises and calming yourself and centering yourself before you walk on stage for me has been kind of returning to that mentality of communication, knowing that there's like there's a dialogue happening once I step on that stage and the audience is waiting for me to say something spectacular, if you will. And I can't do that if I'm thinking about how I'm gonna do this and what notes I'm gonna sing here. So it's just very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I have a few, I think this was before you. I don't know who you were here or not, uh, not, but anyway, I was talking about how when I was a teenager, I was trained as a classical singer. And I tried to sing the blues. I couldn't do it. So I had, I had, to, I had to make adjustments because I didn't want to lose that part of myself. You know, because I was brought up singing black music, you know, so. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, human beings are communal, you know. A music ex, uh, offering, I use different terms. Um, when you give a music offering, you're, you're communicating with the people who are in the space where you're doing this. So there's a communication going on. Sometimes it's visible, a lot of times it's not. I've seen people in the audience cry when I'm performing, you know. Um, and I've watched performance where it made me cry, you know, because the music touched that deeply. And to me, that's, that's what it's about. It's about that. It takes, it takes a person out of their everyday life and for a few brief, brief moments, they're in another space. And they walk out of that auditorium or that, wherever you're performing, they feel, they feel better. They feel better than they did maybe earlier that day, you know. And uh, listening to, to uh, the, the master musicians, you know. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of John Coltrane. John Coltrane, later music, in his later life, to me is spiritual music. Um, Coltrane is one of the few musicians I can listen to that makes me cry. I get touched by his music like that, you know. And, and th that inspires me with my own musicianship, you know, to, to have that kind of an impact on the people that hear the music that I'm performing. I want people to really, I want to touch them. You know, sometimes your, your music can actually heal a person and you don't even realize it. You know, but that person is in a whole different state. And these things happen when you relax. You're not worried about this note, that note, you know, or anything like that. Or even you may, be, as, a, as a vocalist, you may say, oh, my voice is kind of rough today. You know, you, you, you forget about that and you go ahead and perform. You know, and people appreciate that. Any other questions? And I, I do kind of wonder about the audience, especially um, breathing. You know, a breathing exercise really helps remind me that performing is for my own enjoyment and my own body, like physical <coughs> pleasure. It's about my own like 
the pleasure that you can get from expressing yourself and finding finding yourself resonating internally. And especially post-pandemic, like playing shows again, I feel so curious about what other people experience. I'm like, I'm like addicted to trying to figure out what people how how do you like it or what happened for you? You know, I feel like a, an intense curiosity about what other people think. And I also know I cannot control their experience and do not wish to. Like, I, I do want people to be moved by the work. And also, I do not want to control them. And I do not actually need to, like, ex- like... I don't need everyone to tell me I did a good job, you know? I'm, but I'm really feeling a lot of tension post-pandemic about exactly this audience question, like, do you all, do you or you all like, visualize an audience member's experience? Do you, you know, when you're, when you're beyond performance, does it matter what other people think about what's happening to you? Or do, do you not think about that? Or, do you believe what anybody says after the show about how about how it made them feel? Like you know, I'm just I'm I'm thinking stuff like that all the time now. I'm playing shows again. Well, um, you brought up a, a lot of uh, good points. Uh, human beings want to be accepted. That's our nature. So when you put something out you expect something in return. That's just a natural inclination. Um, I don't worry about what the audience thinks because that can hang you up, okay? Um, You do your best that you can do at that given moment. I believe every human being does their best 99.9% 99.9% of the time in any given moment. I don't think people just intentionally all the time make negative moves, you know. So I wouldn't worry about so much what people think. And I think when people give you a compliment, that compliment is genuine. We sometimes may think I deserve that. I didn't like the performance. You know, we're very critical of our performance. You know, sometimes we can be critical to a fault. Okay? We don't want to go there because that's damaging. But you do critique yourself and you say, well, you know, I could have did this, I could have said that, you know. But don't don't stay up all night losing sleep about it, you know. and like I said, this, this zone that you we, we're talking about, the other side of uh, performing, this is something that's elusive. It doesn't happen all the time. I don't, I don't believe any musician uh, has been able to maintain something like that on a permanent basis. I just think that uh, when it happens, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful thing. The audience, um, they can feel it. They get a, a great appreciation for what you what you've done musically. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't over criticize my performance. You know, as I was saying earlier in the talk, as a musician, you're a lifetime student. So music is so vast, you'll never learn it all. Not in one lifetime, you know. It's just that that fast, and um, so um, you do the best you can, and you leave it at that. You know, if you if you made a big mistake, you you recognize it, you correct it. That way, you don't make that same mistake again. You know, we've all made mistakes before. You know, I, I played my flute and played it out of tune, you know, uh, when I didn't intend to, you know, or your voice may crack, you know. Uh, but uh, I never forget this statement Miles Davis said. He said, 
There are no wrong notes. It's how you recover from that note. Herbie Hancock told of the experience he had with Miles Webb. They were playing a tune and he was playing something totally different. And he said, Miles paused for a second and played some stuff that complimented what he was playing. Mm -hmm. And he said that was a great lesson for him, mm -hmm. you know. So be confident, you know, be, be free. This is, what, this is what you want to be. You want to be free to express yourself. You don't want to have anything holding you back. You know, this is, this is what the other side, this is part of the other side of performance, being free, being able to freely express yourself musically, you know. And as you go on your musical journey, you're gonna grow as a musician. You're gonna get better and better and better and better and better and better. And you just never stop. You know, if, if, you, if you want to pursue that, I've seen musicians, you see them 10, 15 years ago, they sound the same. Okay, that's the time. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, you all have been a wonderful audience. I appreciate you and thank you for coming out. And uh, this concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Merci.
Thank <laughs> you. 